Welcome to the War for Talent event. I'm your host and president of Device Alliance, Scott Johnson. Device Alliance is a nonprofit association exclusively focused on helping Orange County's professionals in the MedTech ecosystem with career development, career advancement, business connections, and fostering impactful relationships that build collaboration and community. Thank you all for taking the time to join us during Orange County's MedTech Week. The War for Talent event will be addressing the current challenges of hiring and retaining employees from both the employer and employee perspective within the MedTech industry. Tonight, we will be hearing from a distinguished panel of experts and leaders in Orange County's MedTech community on hiring, talent needs and shortages, how to position yourself for success when looking for career opportunities, strategies for hiring managers, and much more. The event will also offer breakout rooms for intimate discussions on hiring, job seeking, and resume building. As always, this event would not be possible without the generous support of our platinum, gold, and silver sponsors. For that, we thank you very much for your generous support. To set the intent and the purpose of this evening, first we'd like to share with you a high level agenda of how the event will be structured. First, we will be breaking down a panel discussion which will consume the first hour up until 6.25. At that point in time, we will be giving a, break, a brief break to describe to you how each of the breakout sessions will work. And in addition, this will give you an opportunity to interact with each of these companies in a live Q&A discussion. We will briefly instruct you on how to best be prepared for this at the end of the breakout room sessions. And now, as we prepare your breakout room sessions from our hosts is Axonix, Edward Life Sciences, and C-Spine. It is now my honor to introduce tonight's panelists for our War for Talent event. Charlene Lowe is a Global Talent Acquisition Director at Danaher. With 14 years of talent acquisition experience, she currently serves on the Global Talent Acquisition Leadership Team to address hiring challenges on six continents and 60 countries. In her career, she has transformed talent acquisition strategies and programs at several organizations, strengthened employer brands, magnetically attracting mission critical talent and improving employee satisfaction and retention. Jason Marciando is a plant general manager at Edwards Life Sciences. Jason has held several leadership roles within the medtech industry around the globe over the past 17 years, including operations director and director of manufacturing for J&J. In addition, his leadership roles, Jason has overseen hiring and talent development programs for large-scale teams. Megan Cooper is a senior director of global recruiting at Massimo. With over 19 years of recruiting experience, Megan leads oversight for talent acquisition initiatives to successfully meet the recruitment and onboarding needs of Massimo. And her focus is on recruitment analytics, building strong recruitment teams, implementing process improvement, and client customer service and satisfaction. Sarah Lee is a human resource director at Medtronic. And with over 12 years of human resource experience, Sarah oversees designing Medtronic's implementation and driving talent strategies and programs for their business group to enhance the effectiveness of leaders and development of talent. And for our event moderator, moderator Steve Farrell. Steve is a senior director and program manager at Medtronic Neurovascular. And for 18 years, Steve has held operational leadership roles within med tech companies such as Edwards Life Sciences and Hallard Health. Steve works across organizations through global engagement and matrix responsibilities to enable management, governance, and execution of key divisional projects. Steve has led development of complex business processes and global matrix teams to improve project management principles and practices that ultimately improve productivity from work intake to value realization of projects. Steve is also a member of senior cross-functional leadership teams for the business units at Medtronic. And now to kick off the event, I'd like to introduce you all to Steve Farrell. Steve. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Their families and loved ones are safe in this time. Uh, so thrilled to be here to moderate this panel uh, of distinguished panelists on the War for Talent. You know, first thing I'm going to do uh, when we get off this call is shorten my introduction. That was just a tad long, but uh, I'm glad we finally got through it. And uh, I expect it to be the solemn duty of this panel and Scott 
to let me know if a fly lands on my head and stays there. I really need to understand that. So please do that. So team, let's jump right into it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start off with a meaty question here uh, in the war for talent. Uh, and this question will start off with Charlene Lowe. I'll throw it to you first. What are the mega trends panel, uh, regardless of COVID, uh, that have transformed the selling proposition for your company? How have you had to adapt that selling proposition to win the war for talent? So Charlene Lowe. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining, and thanks for the question. So some of the megatrends that are impacting our company, Danaher, Danaher is a very large life sciences, diagnostics, and water quality company, and the work that we're doing right now is for two of our platforms completely around the pandemic and COVID actually. So that is an amazing uh, megatrend that's happening that's really impacting our business. But you, you characterize the question a bit in the AVP or the associate value proposition or the value proposition for talent, I think is so important, especially now people want to do work that makes a difference in the world. Uh, they want to impact people's lives positively. And I think that's been the biggest trend over the last several years, actually. And so as companies, we really need to differentiate ourselves so that uh, talent is attracted to us and is excited, you know, jumps out of bed in the morning to race to work to even if that's in their office right in their home uh, to make a difference to do really impactful work to make a difference. And I think the other mega trend uh, really also is that uh, people are much more focused on their own development and their own professional growth much more. And so I think those th those two things kind of go in parallel. How can I um, uh, tap into my strengths to really make a difference in the world and leave a legacy. So that's one thing that I would say. Steve, I think you're muted. Were you just talking? Okay. Yes. Thank you. I thought I hit it, but I didn't press it down. Megan, let's throw it over to you. Uh, what are the mega trends in the value proposition for Massimo? That are regardless of COVID, and how have you, how have you had to adapt uh, to win the war? For yeah, you know, I, I would say very similar to Charlene. Our, um, you know, we've been we've had a COVID response with a, um, a device, a monitoring device. So that's been having a purpose and a meaning in your work. Um, one of our uh, leaders in engineering came from a consumer products um, background and was was talking to him, and he he had a very successful career. Um, but you can still do the kind of sexy, in this case, engineering work, but still in an industry that has impact and has value. Um, but if I were to take it at, at a different angle on the um, value proposition, um, I think what's been a challenge and, and um, a mega trend for us is a focus on our employment brand. Uh, employment brand has always been so important, but now with the pivot of COVID and things going virtual, including interviewing and, you know, Essentially, people working from home. Um, what we've had to do to get our story out in the public uh, has been uh, quite a pivot over the last six to nine months. Um, where previously we'd be able to go to in-person events or have people in our very impressive office show people our product, that hasn't been able to happen with COVID. So the mega trend is taking that story, taking that value proposition, and putting it out there so that the public can see. As a follow-up, um, Megan, it's getting out there, uh, I, I take it you're talking about the pivot from in-person events to digital, right? And how you kind of make a difference there. And, and you know, besides the obvious channels of LinkedIn and per perhaps amping up your presence there, have there been uh, any other steps you've taken to be able to perpetuate that brand, you know, selling and that brand problem? Yeah, I, you know, at Massimo, we have a very, very strong product brand. Um, and we haven't had to rely necessarily on an employment brand because we bring candidates into the office and it's, it's so impressive. You see, the, you see the product that we work on, you see the impressive cafe, the gym, the Southern California volleyball, sand volleyball court, all of the things that go into the culture that help make the culture. You walk into the office and you kind of just feel that. With that taken away, um, we've looked at a lot of um, more online sites, things, um, traditional ones like you mentioned, like LinkedIn, Indeed, um, 
uh, Glassdoor, but also looked at doing some um, digital digital ads um, that focus not on our product, not necessarily we've always done that, but on the, what it's like to work there. So if you're a potential candidate and you're going to try to figure out what it's like to work at Massimo, you have that information at your fingertips. That's a great call out. Uh, thank you for that. Jason, let's throw it over to you uh, uh, from Edwards Life Sciences. Um, how, has, how has the value proposition for talent uh, changed you, you know, for your company and the war for talent over time? What are, what are the mega trends that are driving it for Edwards? I think Charlene and Megan said it best for a lot of our companies. I mean, it comes down to our work as purpose and being able to get that across to the, the folks that are wanting to join our organizations is you know, tremendously impactful and important. But I would say that recently, a lot of folks are coming in wanting to understand the resiliency of our company, our portfolio, our position in the marketplace. And I think, you know, even through these uncertain times, being able to demonstrate how we are either rebounding or we are in lean is really key for people uh, who are interested in joining Edwards Life Sciences. Okay, Sarah, so as we shift to Medtronic, I mean, I think I know a little bit of the answer to this, but getting your perspective uh, from Medtronic, tell us about, uh, you know, how Medtronic has had to shift its value proposition. Medtronic Neurovascular in Southern California, and, um, you know, we, there have been some interesting things brought up around, you know, uh, employment brand versus product brand and having to get our, our presence out there. So what are your thoughts? Yes. Um, so for me, like with Medtronic, it's it's one of the advantages of being part of Medtronic is being, you know, largest global device company in, um, in the world. And so that helps. Um, but for us, you know, Steve, working with a neurovascular, we're not at headquarters. So one of the shifts that we had to really think about for ourselves is building brand locally. What does that look like in Orange County and really attracting our talent to Orange County neurovascular Medtronic location. So that's been a, that's been a change um, or an addition or a focus. And I would say too that um, really when we when I think about the war on talent, I think about you know what do employees want? And one of the things that I've seen um, besides you know being passionate about what we do day in, day out, about you know giving back to the world um, through med device, um, one of the trends that I'm seeing is really about, you know, how quickly can we move in terms of, you know, speed or product to market and, um, you know, partnering with UCIs and talking, talking to folks, uh, you know, within UCI or graduate students that they, they really brought that to the forefront ask, and asking those thoughtful questions. So I think that's a trend. Thank you for that. That's great. Uh, and as a follow-up, there was, you know, Charlene, you mentioned something in your, uh, you know, answer about um, really finding personnel uh, and and finding that, you know, people want to make a difference in their in their jobs and in their careers. Um, and we'll start with you again on this one, since you brought up that point in your answer, Charlene. Uh, do you find that to be a variant by generation, uh, stage in career? Uh, do you find that kind of early career people kind of think more of that than folks in mid or later staging career? Do you find a difference? I think everybody wants to make a difference. I think that uh, as it's gotten more and more competitive with companies here in the last few years, that probably the generation that are recent college grads and coming into the workforce now are more used to seeing the, a very clear value proposition being advertised as an employer brand. Companies are putting more investment there, more they have more sophistication there. So it's more common uh, to understand that that is what differentiates companies. And so with you know recent grads, for example, but I think everybody, all generations wanna do meaningful, impactful work. Uh, uh, I don't think that's different across the generations. One thing that might be new, I guess, or even uh, more highlighted and spotlighted at this moment is this 
uh, this um, desire for belonging and inclusion. And I think companies, especially in this world where we're seeing um, uh, companies step up to the plate as it relates to social justice and really developing a culture that draws people in so that they belong. Uh, and that I think kind of is new actually, and uh, is uh, something that certainly recent grads and folks joining the workforce at this time are looking for. But it's something that everybody wants. They wanna make an impact, they wanna make a difference and they wanna belong, they wanna be included. And, and the fact of the matter is people who are included and do belong feel like this, this deep belonging with a company, they do better work. Um, and in the end, if you're delivering uh, products and services um, that it is helping society and helping people at the end of the day, then a higher performing work workforce is like making a positive dent in society. All of that deep understanding of how that, the meaning of work in our lives, I think is just becoming very poignant more recently due to, first of all, our own sophistication in communicating our employer brand and the, and the digital marketing that was mentioned as well. Um, and uh, our need to differentiate to attract talent. So I think all of those things are playing into that. Thank you for that, certainly. And as a quick follow-up to that, Sarah, kind of throwing it around and mixing it up back to you. I mean, how, how to, as you talk about making a difference and, and even if it's social justice or, you know, how your products make a difference in the market or to patients or to, you know, ultimately the end users, Sarah, how, how, how does Medtronic go about doing that? And how, how would a company maybe generically go about doing that for, you know, some, you know, folks looking to, you know, win the war for talent in the marketplace? So I think there's, there's no one short answer for that, um, Steve. I think really, you know, looking at company culture and really articulating the company culture and how um, that could be a match for a potential candidate or employee and really showing them through a day in the life or um, through specific examples in terms of what they can do and what they can accomplish. You know, I can share with you that I've, I've had so many opportunities to get to know folks at Medtronic and their longstanding careers and really understanding how they've been able to really develop themselves within Medtronic through a multitude of years, I feel like, you know, the average person that I've talked to has been a Medtronic, you know, for 10 years, but yet has had, you know, six different roles. And so, but really um, being able to capture that and, and sharing that with the candidates to help them understand that, yes, there's, there's opportunities, there's uh, ways to make an impact, there's uh, ways to belong, and it doesn't always have to be in the same spot. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, Jason, you know, that it's Sarah made brief mention of the mission at Medtronic. I know Edwards has, you know, a strong mission as well. And, you know, can you talk about maybe how you link that mission back to, you know, a purpose in the role, right, for people coming in and, and how that makes a difference in people doing their kind of, you know, day-to-day -day jobs and, and really making, as Charlene said, making a difference in what they do. Yeah, so I uh, I had 21 years with another company before I came to Edwards three years ago. And uh, I, the company I worked at before did a great job of really connecting the what we do to the patient, the impact we can have on a patient every day and why we have to do a good job every day. But I never saw it as strong as I saw it at Edwards. And our tagline is life is now. And that can apply to many different segments of how we focus our work. But when you think about uh, the opportunities that we have to really save life with our products is tremendous. And we take great advantage of it by bringing in over 100 patients a year to meet the people who actually make the products that those patients have benefited from. And it's tremendous and you feel it in just about every discussion in every part of the business on how important our work is and really the impact that we have um, on the community as a whole. And so it's just kind of a, a great sounding board that we continue to see day in and day out. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or if you're the first line worker, everybody knows that that's why we're here. Thank you, Jason, appreciate that. And Megan, just to close up this point, anything to add from Massimo in terms of, you know, how you go about uh, making that fulfillment and making a difference in people's jobs, kind of have that come through uh, when people come to work for Massimo related to a mission, related to giving back to the community and, and you know, touching your end user. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I would say we've got two really um, interesting touch points here. Um, we've got our mission, you know, tied to patient safety, of course. Um, and we have a foundation that ties to that. So, you know, there's events and there's funding and there's a lot of drive and excitement around that mission and that foundation and all the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis ties to that. So I think as Charlene was saying earlier, it's not, you know, the new grads that get excited about that. It's not the executives that get excited about that. Everybody really gets behind that mission. Um, and we go forward towards that. Now, being from a large city in the East Coast, um, I think one of the other things that's a little bit different from my perspective is um, the commitment also, separate from our mission, but the commitment to the community that we work and live in. Um, Orange County is, it's fairly small, um, but it's wildly diverse. Um, so outside of the patient safety network, the patient safety movement and that foundation, we do also get involved and have partnerships with organizations that you can really be proud of um, that are around underrepresented communities in our, in our backyard, that are around education, that are around medical testing, um, that may not have a, a really strong tie to say pulse oximetry, but it has a tie and a meaning to a, a, a purpose bigger than, than what we do. Thank you for that, Megan. And panel, let's let's move on here. Uh, talk about working from home. COVID's made this reality for most, if not all, of us. Uh, and talk about your work from home and remote work culture. How has your company adapted, and has it changed your company's mindset on what work is truly in person versus remote work? Do you think it's changing the landscape for you going forward as a business? It could be functionally dependent. It could be broader than that. Uh, Jason, let's start with you on this. Yeah, I would say, you know, agility is the word of the year for us. Um, seems like every day we're having to deal with something new. You know, just starting yesterday with the uh, wildfires and having to, again, find another way to accomplish something without having a plan for it. But I would say, you know, for the most part, it's just tremendous that um, we, we build a platform of diversity and not just in diversity of person, but in diversity of think and approach to solving solutions. And some of the creative ideas and the things that have come out have been just overwhelming. And I think they're here to last, you know, beyond what we learned in this year. So probably a great growth year. And we just don't realize it yet from how we're going to migrate from doing things traditionally to new ways of thinking and doing. Well, as my dad would say, it builds character. Right. I guess that's what's happening now. Right. So um, let's send it over to uh, send it over to Megan next. Megan, same question. Right. So how is Massimo adapted here and how do you see it impacting your complexion of, you know, what you think of remote work going forward and, and you know, how you think the company is going to adapt and maybe change for the long term? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want this to come off negatively, but I actually am very proud to say I don't think we have the answer. I mean, we are still so in the heart of this thing right now. I mean, this we don't know how long this is going on. We have, as um, I think the, the answer earlier, Jason was saying, or the word you were saying was agility. I think our over word, overused word is pivot. Um, we pivot every, you know, every time we send people home because that's the safe thing to do. And then we realize, oh gosh, we can bring we can bring groups back and keep them socially distanced and separated, and then they'll have access to things that are necessary, um, like engineering labs, for instance. That's a very difficult thing to do from home. Um, and those people are, are really dying to get back into the actual products and pushing that stuff forward. Um, so it's a constant, it's a constant learning um, opportunity for us. And I think being able as an organization to say, we don't know um, is actually not a bad thing. Um, because every week we're trying something a little bit different and we're trying something and then we're, you know, we're back to people, our kids are back to school. We might have to try something a little bit different. So um, will it change the way we do things in the future? Absolutely. Will it change thing, the way we do things next week? Absolutely. So I think pivot is the word um, and, and being able to just kind of you know, I, looking for candidates, I think was another a question that you were talking about earlier. Um, having the ability to have that flexibility and that um, ability to roll with the punches, like you said, is, is gonna be a 
huge um, piece of, of character and candidate that I think all organizations are going to look for in the future. So we've got to be agile, right? So um, Sarah, anything to add there, you know, from Medtronic's perspective, what do you, what do you think Medtronic is, you know, kind of thought about this and, uh, you know, neurovascular in particular and, and how we might approach this to change the way we think about, you know, work from home and remote work. So it has. So Steve, you and I are partnered on the business continuity planning team for neurovascular and just really thinking through how COVID impacts our work. Um, really getting products to our patients and um, just thinking through how it impacts our employees. And so one of the things I'll have to say with COVID besides, you know, the need for agility, flexibility, and just trying to pivot and prioritize is really um, kind of thinking through like how much our employees have risen to the challenge. It's been um, a phenomenal, um, you know, time, even with all this, you know, fluidity and how time and time again, our employees figure out a way. And whether it's from, you know, our sales folks that go into the hospitals or OR every day, pivoting to now, you know, doing not FaceTime, but doing remote trainings or, um, you know, just figuring out different ways day in, day out for solutions that we thought could only be done in person. So I think, um, you know, I learned lessons every single day as we're going through this fluidity and I'm just so proud to say that time and time again, you know, employees figure out a way. And I see Medtronic, you know, really changing kind of their um, perspectives on what it means to work remote. It's been nice. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Charlene, what about you at, at uh, Danaher, right? How's it impacted the way you look at, uh, you know, remote work from home and, and you know, the culture? And, and do you see any lasting change or is it, you know, continuing to be the story of just adapting and, you know, trying to make best. Well, what's really surprised me is how uh, productive we can be virtually. So uh, many of, much of the team was already remote, actually. We had a large remote workforce, um, but now that we're fully remote, uh, we can do all of our interviews, for example, without travel. And so we can include a lot more candidates in the selection process because of the virtual nature of interviews. So we've been able to be much more productive and higher performing because of the virtual environment. So uh, finding those areas where it's really improved our performance, um, I think that's really interesting. My one concern uh, or, or one of my bigger concerns is the uh, work-life balance. So we do find people working much earlier in the morning and until much later in the evening. Uh, and they're really glued to their computer, you know, rarely stepping away. It's not good uh, mentally. It's not good, you know, from uh, just phys physical and mental exhaustion looking at the screen. So I worry about that. And I hope that as we continue on, we develop solutions and uh, tools and things like that, that we can make sure that our associates are experiencing a healthy work-life balance. So, but in general, I have to say it's been very positive, very productive. And if when it uh, comes to job search and interviewing, it's been very, very positive addition. So, uh, Charlene, just following up with you right away then, how is it, it doesn't sound like it's changed a lot in the way that you recruit, or have you had to make some pivots there? Uh, has it been pretty, uh, pretty smooth transition for it's been remarkably uh, smooth. It's been unbelievably smooth. So uh, I echo what all of the other panelists said about pivoting and being agile and our associates rising to the occasion. All of that is true and more. Um, uh, how it may have changed, uh, it allows more people into the process, I think, first of all, uh, because of the flexible nature of uh, not having the travel and so on and so forth uh, associated with interviews. So that. Uh, but it's also allowed us to tap a bit more into uh, additional talent that may not be located at our sites. So expanded the aperture and widened the aperture of the talent that we can consider. And uh, I think that that would be how it's changed, you know, for the most part. Great call out. Megan, um, what about you? Has it has this work from home um, How's that impacted the, re the recruiting process for Massimo? Is it, it kind of 
made it more challenging uh, based on where you were, or has it been pretty seamless for you? Uh, how's it looking for? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, when we first started, it was obviously a big change going from having people coming into the office and having that face-to-face, -face, and that's, all, that's the way we've always done it, to quickly shifting and interviewing in this type of style. And I think it was really, it was great for us as a recruiting team. We got to do a lot of research on what tools work best. Okay, so we can't code on a whiteboard. Where can we code? How can we, you know, how can we test those capabilities in another way? Um, so, I mean, the hard part, the pivot getting everything online was probably the difficult part. Now that we're in that phase, I mean, I'd echo Charlene. I, it, it's probably so much better, at least in the initial round stages. You can see a much greater number of, of people. Um, but also, I mean, you don't have to like, you don't have to schedule, people don't have to get, you know, take a day off of work to come into the office. Even if it's a one hour interview, they're not gonna show up in a suit for their, you know, for their interview. They might show up in a jacket with shorts on and then go back to their laptop and continue their work. Um, so we're seeing a lot greater candidate flow because we've become more flexible on our end with um, our interviewing techniques. Now that's because of, of COVID, but is that something that we've learned throughout this challenging situation and, and maybe something that stays with us? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where we we felt the the agility in the in the interviewing process the most. Thank you, Jason. Has how's the work from home piece kind of changed the way Edwards recruits or you recruit? Any any significant? Change? Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Because I sit uh, managing a plant with a large scale production. We have over a thousand people that we support. And so a lot of the people that I'm personally recruiting for, you know, we, we at least have to have on some kind of rotation into the plant. Um, we do have some jobs that can be done completely remotely, like our finance and our planning and things like that. But, you know, for the most part, what we're trying to do is build a safe work environment, manage it to the best of our ability and you know, be, have that flexibility because right now a lot of folks, you know, they have young children, they may have school situations, they may have a, a personal health condition that really requires them to be uh, less exposed, if you will, during this time frame. And so we've built in uh, flexibility and, and ways to manage that through the teams. I would say, though, that what concerns me sometimes is everybody who gets really comfortable working remotely 100% of the time, at some point or, or another, they end up counting on somebody who's on site and they end up asking them to do things that weren't necessarily, you know, part of what they were doing on a normal basis. So we've had to adjust a little bit the flexibility, um, but, or adjust the expectations and responsibilities of people to accommodate those situations. Um, not that they're bad, but in some cases, you know, we'd like to correct those in the, in the future when we can. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, we, we're very clear up front as far as what the expectations are, uh, what can be supported remotely, what needs to be on a rotation onto the site and support. Um, but you know, I think what we have created is a culture that is more tolerant of being uh, amenable to things aren't as normal as they used to be and we're gonna have to evolve and adjust. So that's a positive for me to see that happening out there right now. Thanks, Jason. Sarah, anything to add there uh, about how the work from home culture has impacted the way we go about recruiting? Yes. So, I mean, I think a lot of folks have shared already, um, including myself, the great things about working remote to allow for that flexibility, allow for new ways of thinking. Um, but I also want to share kind of a different perspective as well. And um, to kind of tag um, on Charlene's comment about her concern around, you know, work-life balance. Um, us too at Medtronic, we see folks up really early in the morning, 5 a.m. plus on calls all the way, 12 hours past. And we, we started to see um, Zoom burnout, if you will, or meet, you know, online meeting burnout. And one of the things that, you know, Steve, you and I are part of is, is figuring out a way to have more effective meetings. And um, we, you know, at Neurovascular um, in Orange County, as part of Medtronic, we do have a large R&D population. And R&D folks, you know, they want to be in the lab, they want to touch the product, they need to test it. 
And um, it wasn't as effective as we had hoped doing all of this remotely. So we really had to figure out on you know ways to keep our employees safe and to allow them to come back in a safe manner to resume the activities that they need to do to help our patients. And so we had to think about everything from you know meeting space because again with you know trying to think through you know an effective meeting uh, collaboration areas we have to be six feet apart you know mask on you know what about whiteboards what about things we can or can't touch and we had to think through all those logistics and um, in, in coming up with new solutions around that with the COVID restraints and with safety you know first and foremost on top of mind. We, we're starting to figure it out and um, we're starting to see more and more employees feeling comfortable to come back, more engagement, less meetings on the calendar because folks are coming into the office and collaborating safely. So it's been a very interesting journey and, and I'm sure we'll continue to think of new and different ways to be more effective because of COVID. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, Megan, let's start with you on this next question. And, and panel, this is a panel of HR leaders and, and hiring managers, right? And you're con continually conducting interviews. And these interviews have shifted to largely a virtual format. Um, what has changed in how you expect the candidate to show up these interviews? So for those candidates in the audience here, you know, how, how, how do you see it as a hiring manager and how they show up versus how they showed up in person, uh, you know, before COVID? Megan, let's start with you. Yeah, I would say really not a lot. Um, in fact, that's probably one of the biggest downfalls in the candidates that we've seen. Um, Zoom is a little bit more, um, it's Zoom or any of the platforms are a little bit more um, low key. They're a little bit more um, casual. Um, but it's still an interview, uh, you know, showing up, dressing, right, making sure that your connection works, albeit right now I'm, I'm happy this is all working with what we've got going on with the fires and everything in Southern California, um, but testing that stuff, um, making sure that you have questions ready, all of the things that you would have had to do before, um, just because you're on a Zoom sitting on your couch and it's a little bit more comfortable, it's, it's the exact same thing. So I would, I would say be... And we say this to our own interviewers too. I, you know, candidates should be putting in and are putting in the amount of effort that they always have been. The research on the organization, getting their questions down, the background on the interviewers that they're interviewing with, um, that all of that should stay exactly the same. The only, you know, caveat would be kind of just testing your technology, testing your lighting, maybe getting on a Zoom with a friend just before to make sure you're sitting in the right place or you know, but then, you know, I would add to that, give yourself a little bit of grace too. Sometimes things don't work out perfectly. Um, sometimes the dog runs behind you and barks at the Amazon guy and you can do everything to prepare that that doesn't happen, but it might, um, and that's okay. That's something that wouldn't happen in a, a normal interview process, hopefully. Um, so, I mean, just being able to pick back up and continue on or the the baby cries or whatever that whatever the case may be to understand that plan for everything that you can but in the case that something does happen at the end of the day you're at your house so it's okay if something does um don't let that throw you off at all just try to compose yourself and and move on thank you for that i can tell you that uh the guy with the leaf blower seems to know exactly when i'm on the phone with my boss he totally seems to know that. He just fires it up every time. Um, 100%. Charlie, let's, yeah, so Charlie, let's, let's go to you on that. Uh, is, there, um, is there a change in how you expect the candidate to show up here? Um, maybe, you know, a little more of an informal conversation or do you expect the same rigor as, as you know, Megan? Yeah, I'd have to echo what Megan said, that it hasn't changed a lot from the expectation as it relates to the interview itself. 
Here is one recommendation though. I would say that it is best to have a space to do this uh, and not do it while in motion. So recently I experienced a candidate interviewing who was driving a car at the same time, uh, using a phone, you know, uh, holding it with one hand, steering with the other, you know, I think that that's unacceptable. I, that was a bad setup, doesn't show up well. I recommend if you're a candidate for a job that you at least um, find a static place. Uh, I have no problem, however, with leaf blowers, dogs, cats, uh, kids, whatever the case may be. In fact, I think that's one of the huge positives that's come out of um, this all this virtual work, actually, especially with our coworkers, for example. I've gotten to meet everybody's cats and dogs and kids, and uh, I get to know them on a more personal level than I probably ever have before. Um, I kind of get a sense for, you know, the their style of their decor and what they like, um, because they're, you know, maybe a little bit more casually dressed, might understand their sports teams, and, you know, there's there's kind of this personal connection that you can develop with this background, background noise that's happening. And so I, I look on it as an opportunity to connect. Uh, versus a distraction. Uh, the, the driving and interviewing at the same time, that I felt was a distraction. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, we're all getting used to how to do this, but I think uh, you need to really focus and yet at the same time, allow life to come in. Yeah, driving during an interview is also dangerous, uh, I think. So um, Sarah, anything to add there? Do, do you think there's a change and how you expect candidates to show up uh, in terms of a virtual interview as, as opposed to in-person. Shared on um, remaining static. So I did have an interview recently where the person wasn't driving, but they were walking around holding their phone as they were FaceTiming me and answering the questions. And I just started to feel a little nauseous, just not from their, you know, how they were answering the questions, but just all the movement that they had. So that's one big tip. And then, um, so that I, I wanna elaborate on with Charlene. And then the other thing too, is that um, my expectations are, are pretty much the same. I do expect folks to you know, show up professionally, hair combed, um, you know, professional clothing on, um, not wearing sweat shirts, you know, sweat tops. I mean, sweat bottoms is okay, as long as I don't see it. But, you know, I, I do expect professionalism as they show up on um, on the on the call. So that is something that I do still, you know, old fashioned or not still expect. Um, in terms of other tips, I would Sarah, you, I think you're not pressing it down fully there. Okay, I think we lost the last 10 seconds of that. Um, Jason, let's shift it over to you real quick. Um, any uh, changes, uh, especially from your perspective as a plant leader, uh, any changes uh, in the virtual interview process and how you expect a candidate to show up and, and what advice you'd have? Yeah, I would definitely say that, you know, most people need to realize that they're more vulnerable uh, with what's going on around them when they're in an interview virtually. Um, and you can get too comfortable and you can be very casual when, you know, you may be applying for a very serious opportunity. So I think it's not a bad idea to practice with somebody and say, hey, can you give me some feedback? I want to do a call with you real quick. Ask me some challenging questions. Let me know what you think about this interview. But it, it is interesting how callous that we can be in a video call versus when we're one-on-one -on -one and we're you know, interacting on a very physical, personal level with our interview and our style of interview and approach versus how you lose that in a two-dimensional screen image. So I would say it is definitely good to come prepared to be well rehearsed if you're very serious about the job. And the work you put into that virtual interview is going to demonstrate how serious you are about making that connection and being the best candidate we could hire. Great, thank you for that. And and as a as a follow up, um, you know, Sarah, have you found that hiring managers uh, are struggling to adapt to interview uh, in the virtual format from the hiring manager side? 
versus the candidate side? Is there what kind of shift has there been there, or is that, has that been pretty seen? So I would say that um, I, I have heard some hiring managers share that they miss the face to face. Um, they want to see the full body in terms of communication and the body language in terms of how candidates are responding. But I think that as time has gone on where you know virtual interviews has become now the new norm, I think I, I do see a lot more managers um, feeling a lot more comfort with virtual interviews because I could say like, you know, the first month I would say when we're, we pivoted to the virtual interview platform, I mean, I got a lot of feedback from hiring managers saying like, how is this possible? It's an R&D engineer. I need to be able to see them. And, and, and you know, a month later, the, the same hiring managers now, you know, hired five people, you know, that he's never seen. So you know, I, I would say that our hiring managers are adapting well. Megan, would you concur with that? Uh, were there some challenges, you know, just uh, for the hiring managers uh, switching to a virtual interview format and have they kind of adapted? Yeah, I, I would absolutely concur with that. In the beginning, it was really hard. It's really, it was really different. And not only in the we want to show, um, we want to see them, you know, interact with them and learn from them or in an R&D capacity, you know, work on coding together or whiteboard or this or that and not having that anymore. Um, but then back to what I was talking about earlier was also the sell component. You know, our hiring managers would get really excited after the interview to take them around and show them the, you know, the office space or where the lab is and how cool this is or that is and how teams work together to, create a product from ideation all the way through. Um, so I think the only two things I would add is one on the interview stages, there, there are some things that just don't work on a typical um, Zoom Teams WebEx. Um, so being able to, you know, we've done a lot of research on some of the stuff where we've seen problems coding as an uh, example. There's a lot of coding tools out there. So we tested a bunch of them. We have one that we use now that worked well with the hiring managers. But I think that worked well for us too, because it showed that we were able to work together. We, we heard their concern, we worked together, we found a solution that it's like a, it's kind of like a whiteboard. Um, but then on the sell side, the other thing that we probably did was bring some of that um, capacity over to the recruiting side and partnership with marketing and creating videos that show what the office is like, what the culture is like. Again, not exactly the same as having somebody really there to see and feel it, but it, it's pretty close. So um, I, it was really hard in the beginning, but I think with the benefits of being able to see so many more candidates and seeing so many more candidates so much more quickly, you know, you've got a candidate coming in from that needs to travel, even if they're traveling from LA, you need a little bit of lead time to have them take the day off or whatever. Now that ha now that's happening so much more quickly. And um, so I think for us, once we got over that initial hump, the benefits of virtual interviewing is far outweighing um, the issues that we faced initially. Charlene, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I absolutely concur with what all the panelists have been saying. Uh, and it reminded me too that we probably increased our usage of assessments, of tech, uh, technical assessments online, uh, things like Codility and various tests that helps us um, evaluate candidates in a very uh, unbiased, objective sort of way. So it's actually, I think, an advantage for the candidates. Uh, the highest performing individual is more likely to be uh, the top candidate. Uh, so I think, it, I think it's a real advantage both for companies and for candidates, so. Great, all right, so team, we have, you know, just over five minutes left. So we're gonna close with a couple of strong ones here, right? So um, Jason, uh, let's lead off with you. What advice, what's, what's your top advice for hiring managers today, right? Your answer could be regardless of COVID or having to do with COVID, but what is your top advice for hiring managers in winning the war for? Yeah, I would say, you know, first thing you do is you have to be a good listener and you have to play off the answers that you get. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people, they have to meet the minimum qualification requirements to apply for an application or a job, right? But then it's really diving into how do they accomplish that role or how do they accomplish the success they've had? And being able to be a good listener and play off those questions uh, and those answers to drive the next question to really understand that person, especially when you're doing it virtually. Um, 
there's a lot of um, opportunities when a person comes on site where you have sidebar conversations and you can ask subtle questions or you can have those, um, those hints to bringing out the characteristics of the person you're looking for. You have to do that a little different now. And so is being a good listener as asking the questions and, and not just you know trying to look for the answer you want, but in dissecting the answer you get to see how you can make that fit or not. Thank you for that. Charlene, what about you? What is your top advice for hiring managers today? I've got two things I tell hiring managers. One, candidates are customers. So that's number one. Uh, number two is adopt a talent scout mentality. So think of yourself as a talent scout. Put your radar up to talent, both internally and externally. When you see good talent, network with them, uh, get to know them. Uh, it's not all around having an open job at the moment and, because you're scrambling. You've got an open job, an open seat, you're scrambling. Instead, have a talent scout mentality. Always have your radar up, reaching out and networking with internal and external talent so that when the time comes, when you do have an opening, a vacancy, an unexpected vacancy, a new ad to your department, you are ready to go. So those would be my two main pieces of advice. Candidates are customers and adopt a talent scout mentality. Thank you, Charlene. Sarah, what is your top advice for hiring managers? is to um, continue to network. And so I like how Charlene put it in, in terms of being a talent scout, but really even being more thoughtful than that as a hiring manager is really reach into you know, networks outside of your company and to build those relationships and to really, when I say build the relationships, not just have like a quick LinkedIn comment and that's it, but actually you know, have a thoughtful um, check-in with future talent that you someday want on your team. So that is that is probably um, a tip that I would give a hiring manager. Okay, Megan, let's close this question out with you. What is your top advice for hiring managers? Okay, so the one that I hear from hiring managers the most since this crisis has started is, well, unemployment is really, you know, really high. So, you know, this should be easy. It is not the case in the industry crossroads that we work in, in medical and technology. They're probably two of the most sought after industries right now. So everything that we had to do before, we still have to do and more. So everything that the other panelists said, it's still so important. Just because what we hear on the news about unemployment, it doesn't necessarily affect this industry right now. Um, so prioritize interviews, prioritize reviewing resumes if the recruiters get them to you. Um, if, it, if an interview comes onto your calendar, take it. Um, know that when a candidate comes in to interview with us um, as an organization, we, I think, are an amazing organization. Um, but we know that because we work here. They don't know that yet. So sell the opportunity um, because they're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing them. Um, so that would be my kind of really keep, keep that bar super high um, because the candidates that we want are in high demand and in high demand by looks like pretty much everybody on this panel. Yes, thank you, Megan. Uh, that said, um, there are a lot of people, so panel, final question here. There are a lot of people trying to break into medical device, right? And while medical and med tech and biotech, and as we look at that space, it's been a little more resilient from the economic downturn as a result of COVID than other spaces. But nevertheless, employment is, unemployment is up, and uh, it's become a little bit more of an employer's market than a candidate's market. So given that, um, Megan, let's start with you on this. Uh, what is your top advice for a candidate, a job seeker, seeking a position in this market? Um, yes, yeah, so I would, um, I mean, I would say, and this is probably, it's, it's so not in our, in our like bit kind of ex look at quick Instagrams or 40 characters or whatever. It's not in that mentality that we live and work in anymore. Um, and it sounds boring, but job descriptions are really, really important. Um, we have a whole host of positions that you don't, you don't need to know what a medical device is outside of like you drove past a hospital. 
it's an electrical engineering job. You may have done it in a consumer product in a tech company, um, but the electrical engineering is electrical engineering. We're looking for people that can do the engineering. We can teach them the industry. You'll see that in a job description versus say some of our product marketing positions. You really need to have a, a deep knowledge in that particular product or that particular area. Um, brain, for instance, like if you don't know that, you'll, you'll see it in the job description that you specifically need that requirement. Um, I think oftentimes now we kind of look at a job, you see the little quick LinkedIn thing that comes and then the three sentences after, and you're like, oh, looks good, I might apply. But if you dig down and really look at the requirements and see what, um, what jobs or what companies are looking for all or any industries or where you need specific industry experience, that'll probably help you get a little less frustrated and target your search a little bit more. Because I can say for Massimo, our R&D department, for the most part, we don't need medical background experience. Thank you for that. Charlene, so given this market and um, you know, your view on, on the world here in this space, uh, what is your top advice for a candidate seeking a position in this market? Persistence, that's what I'd have to say it is. Uh, it's gotta be a persistent approach every day, every week. Uh, you need to have a checklist, you need to be doing things, you need to be researching companies, you need to be customizing your resume for the specific opening, spending an hour or two carefully reviewing your experience and identifying uh, tangential and adjacent type of transferable skills and experience that would relate to a job. Um, it, it is, you've heard before sometimes that it's a full-time job to find a job. It's true. And if you are already working and you're looking to expand your career, develop your career or break into a different industry, persistence is what it's about. It's about setting aside a little bit of time every single day um, and consistently approaching this. And, you know, it's a bit of a numbers game, too. Uh, you're going to get through a lot of no's before you get to a yes. So just in a positive light, every time you get a no, be thankful you're closer to a yes. Thank you for that. Uh, Jason, uh, your thoughts, your your advice, top advice for a candidate seeking a position in this market. Yeah, I was just thinking about it. We hired about 20 to 25 percent of our new hires in the last six months who weren't medical device uh, experienced. But what we reason we hired them for is their skill base and how it was transferable to what we needed to improve on or change or modify. And I would just tell candidates, you need to be honest with yourself. You need to identify what your strengths are, try to align those with what's required of the job you're applying for. At the same time, you've got to understand the gaps that you have and what you're going to do to close those gaps. A couple of people that we hired from the aerospace industry, it's not that they knew medical device regulations, but they understood the importance of um, regulations that were very strict and, and very low tolerance for failure. So, you know, when you can make that adjustment and you can show us how you're going to uh, work to develop yourself to be the best fit possible, it comes through in an interview, and especially when it's genuine. So I look forward to candidates who are, you know, stretching themselves because that shows me they have no limits. Thank you for that, Jason. And finally, Sarah, what is your top advice for a candidate seeking a position in this market? I would say my top advice, so I'm going to, I'm going to focus that on um, new graduates. So for new graduates, one of the things that I would suggest is um, really think through capstone projects um, at your local universities, kind of getting that uh, opportunity and experience um, through those projects at your local university. And then for everyone else, I would say the, the top um, tip that I would have is really networking. So a lot of us know someone who knows someone who knows someone. So consistently get yourself out there and network and put out there what you're looking for and the why and get connected. So those are my top tips. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, panel. Uh, Charlene, Megan, Jason, Sarah, thank you so much for your insights today. Um, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and a wonderful week. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate this panel. It's been a pleasure. I'll hand it back over. Thank you, Steve, uh, for your time. And once again, thank you to our panelists, Charlene Lowe from Danny here, 
Jason Marciano from Edwards, Megan Cooper from Massimo, Sarah Lee and Steve Farrell from Medtronic. Thank you all again for your insights and time. Greatly appreciate it.